The church is about to embark on one of the most sacred seasons, the time in the liturgical year that is known as Holy Week. Uh, It's a week that's full of symbolism and meaning as we go from Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem uh, to his crucifixion, burial, and miraculous rising from the dead. Uh, For many Christians, it's it's a deeply emotional time. It recalls some of the most important and holy events in our history, Uh, And it invites us to experience them as Jesus' disciples experienced them all through these acts of ritual remembrance. Uh, Holy Week is perhaps the most important part of the Christian liturgical year. Uh, While other seasons like Christmas and Pentecost are important and even essential to the Christian story, Holy Week invites us to remember Jesus' dramatic last week on earth. In just a few days, Jesus' entire ministry is transformed. The disciples go from having supper with their teacher and friend to watching him get betrayed, arrested, and brutally executed by an unholy alliance of political and religious power. And then, to their complete and utter surprise, Jesus is raised from the dead. Even from early on in his ministry, Jesus is is clear that this is going to happen. He even shares it openly with his disciples. Uh, In chapter 9 of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But whenever Jesus says these kinds of things, his his disciples don't understand him. Uh, At one point, Peter takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him for talking about it. And that's when Jesus famously calls Peter Satan and tells him to get behind him. Now, for those of us who live almost 2,000 years later, it's hard to imagine just how clueless these disciples were, especially since Jesus tried to spell things out for them. Uh, But it's important to remember how unexpected all of this was, right? Jesus didn't necessarily fit the description of a Messiah, and his death actually shocked his disciples to their core. Many of them went back to their old lives after Jesus was killed, which is why in one resurrection scene, Jesus meets his disciples on the beach while they're fishing, just like he did at the beginning of his ministry. According to some of these pre-resurrection accounts, it seems that the disciples thought that the Christian movement was over. If his death was shocking, then Jesus' resurrection was downright incomprehensible. Because y'all make no mistake, first century people were not stupid. Right? Just like us, they knew that when people die, they stay dead. But Jesus came back, and the body that his disciples experienced him in wasn't quite like it was before. Yes, it had the same scars, but in a, in a strange way, it was also transformed. Jesus appeared in locked rooms and was mistaken for other people. In one particular scene, even his own disciples didn't recognize him until they break bread together. And so Jesus wasn't just resuscitated. His old body was made new. What Holy Week invites us to do is it invites us to experience all of these cataclysmic events as Jesus' disciples experience them. Uh, But to be clear, they're not intended to be historical reenactments. After all, who wants to volunteer to be crucified, right? Instead, what they are is ritual reminders of what is perhaps the heart of our faith, that Jesus willingly died and rose again in order to draw all people to himself. If you look through the various liturgies for Holy Week in the Book of Common Prayer, you'll notice that they are absolutely loaded with theology. And that's because for nearly 2,000 years, the church has tried to make sense of of what exactly went down during those last few days of Jesus' life. When it comes to the cross in particular, countless theologians, scholars, and laypersons have tried to make sense of the saving or salvific nature of Jesus' supreme act of self-sacrifice on Good Friday. But as we walk the way of Holy Week, it's best to leave our assumptions behind. It may seem like dodging the question, but what Jesus did in his death and resurrection is ultimately a mystery. To be clear, it's a mystery that saves us and reunites us with God, but if we try to get too mechanical in explaining it, then we start to create idols. The simplest and most frustratingly vague explanation is perhaps the only one that we should offer, that on the cross, Jesus willingly gave up his life for the life of the world, 
And through his resurrection, Jesus defeated death so that we might experience eternal life with him. And anything beyond that, uh, in my view, misses the poetic nature of these saving events. Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. It's the day when we remember Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In recent history, some churches have combined Palm Sunday with the Passion Narrative, which is what the 1979 Book of Common Prayer does in the Episcopal Church. Uh, In some ways, this is actually kind of a a controversial decision because it messes with the sequence of events. Uh, But from a practical standpoint, it makes sense. Most people come to church on Sundays. If they don't come to church on Good Friday, then they completely miss out on the story of the Passion. But there's also something that's really powerful, I think, about combining Palm Sunday with the Passion narrative. It reminds us that the same crowds who are chanting Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, turn around just days later and start shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And this is foreshadowed, I think, perfectly the 1973 filming of Jesus Christ Superstar, when the crowd suddenly starts singing, Hey, JC, JC, won't you die for me? And at this point in the song, the chord suddenly turns minor, and Jesus has this foreboding look on his face when he remembers what's about to happen. Now, the word Hosanna is both a shout of jubilation and it's a cry for help. While it's often only the former in Christianity, it's generally the latter in Judaism, which makes for a really interesting discussion about what exactly the crowds are shouting at Jesus. Are they praising God for Christ's arrival, or are they begging for liberation from the Roman oppressors? Uh, Maybe it's a combination of both. Holy Week continues with Monday, Thursday, uh, which is the start of the Easter Triduum, the three days leading up to Easter Sunday. You might know it as the day when we wash each other's feet, which is a practice that's as beautiful as it is sometimes awkward. But it's also the day that we celebrate the Last Supper, the night when Jesus instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion. In my home church, we had a simple agape meal around a large wooden table where we washed each other's feet. It was a really powerful moment. And so that Uh, particular service, because it had such a small community, had the same intimate feeling as the Last Supper. Afterwards, we we stripped the altar, which is a Monday-Thursday tradition where all the the candles, the altar hangings, and various uh, liturgical accoutrements are put away. And the sanctuary is left bare, and leftover consecrated bread and wine are put away in the tabernacle for the following day. And in some places, congregants actually keep vigil with the elements throughout the night. The second day of the Easter Triduum is Good Friday. If you know anything about this particular day in the church year, uh, then you might be wondering why we call it Good Friday and not something like really awful, gut-wrenching Friday. Uh, The reason we call it good is because Christians believe that Jesus reveals God's goodness on the cross. Uh, Throughout his ministry, Jesus embodies that goodness to the world, and then he goes to Calvary willingly, showing us that God's goodness is greater than any evil. Christians also believe that that what Jesus did on the cross saves us in an almost inexplicable way. Some early Christian thinkers believe that, that what Christ did on the cross was pay a ransom that humanity owed to death. Others thought that on the cross, Jesus took on our collective sin as a kind of sacrificial lamb and willingly offered himself up to God for our sake. Different texts from the New Testament support what's honestly a combination of these ideas, but the New Testament doesn't seem to settle on a single explanation. At some point in Good Friday, it's also common for congregations to celebrate what's called the Stations of the Cross. In the Episcopal Church, that liturgy can be found in our Book of Occasional Services, Uh, And it's a beautiful and meaningful service. Uh, But the prayer book actually only appoints one liturgy for the second day of the Triduum. During the Good Friday liturgy, the Passion narrative is read, and then we partake in communion from the reserved sacrament that's left over from Thursday. During that time, congregants also pay personal devotions to the cross. Uh, It's an incredibly somber time, but it helps us remember the stark reality of the crucified Messiah. The Easter Triduum 
actually concludes with what's known as the Easter Vigil. Uh, if you look on page 263 of the Book of Common Prayer, then you might notice that there's actually not a Sunday service listed under the, under the proper liturgies uh, for special days. That's because the vigil is actually intended to be the first and primary celebration of Easter in the Episcopal Church. Uh, the Easter Vigil is also known as the Great Vigil, and it traditionally begins sometime after sunset on Holy Saturday. The Vigil consists of four parts, uh, the service of light, the service of lessons, the baptisms, a renewal of baptismal vows, and the Eucharist. Depending on how it's done, uh, the service can go on for quite a long time. At the seminary I attended, the service was usually around three and a half hours, and we always concluded with a, cele- with a celebration uh, that had chocolate fountain, uh, champagne, and different hors d'oeuvres. Um, that might seem lavish, but that's because the end of the Easter vigil is actually Easter itself, the paschal mystery of the crucified and risen Lord. So it's a time of celebration and immense joy. Uh, for the rest of us, of course, is Easter Sunday. Uh, Easter Sunday is the day that the church sings hymns like Jesus Christ is risen today, uh, hail the festival day, and up from the grave he arose, which when I was a kid, I combined with head, shoulders, knees, and toes and thought it was up from the grave he arose with his eyes and his ears and his mouth and his nose. Uh, we usually sing some of those hymns at the end of the vigil as well, so thankfully, the organist doesn't have to rehearse even more songs than they already do. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, you know, Easter Sunday is often the primary celebration of Easter in the Episcopal Church. However, the vigil is still the prayer book's preference. It's a beautiful, engaging, and truly sacred service uh, that invites us to experience God's story of creation and redemption. It begins with the lighting of the Easter fire, which carries us into the darkness, and it ends with songs of joy and praise. And so that is a a brief introduction to Holy Week. Uh, My name is the Reverend Will Berry, and I'm the Associate Rector uh, here at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Charleston, and we would love to have you join us for our Holy Week services. Take care and be blessed.